Hello, welcome to Rocky Mountain Wild's Lunch and Learn, celebrating Colorado's wildlife protections. This presentation is sponsored by Rocky Mountain Wild, Sierra Club Colorado, Audubon Rockies, Great Old Broads for Wilderness, and Audubon Colorado Council. I'd like to thank all of these organizations for their participation in the wildlife rulemaking process in Colorado and for promoting this presentation. What I'm going to be talking about today are some new wildlife rules that were created in Colorado, new regulations for development of oil and gas that protect wildlife. The bulk of my presentation is going to come from a story map that is on the Rocky Mountain Wild webpage. It's, uh, our webpage is rockymountainwild.org and the page with the story map is the COGCC story map. You can also find it under our oil and gas watch. And if you go to the bottom of this page, you'll find links to view a larger story map and to view the interactive map that is part of here. And to make it a little less distracting, I'm going to bring up the uh, story map in its own window. So thank you everyone for coming. Let me tell you a little bit of background about this process. In about 10 years ago, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, which I'm going to be calling COGCC, worked with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to identify high priority habitat areas where wildlife protection should be in place uh, when um, oil and natural gas development is occurring. These were groundbreaking protections at the time, but there was a lot of room for improvement. In 2019, the Colorado legislature um, had a more ambitious plan and they changed the mission of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission from the fostering oil and gas development to regulating it. As part of these, uh, this legislation, COGCC was required to protect public health, self, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife. And the environmental impacts they were required to protect were air, water, soil, and biological resources. This presentation is going to focus on the new rules around protecting wildlife. However, there were other rules that were put into place that were very important for public health uh, and safety and also even for wildlife. For example, a 200-foot um, setback was put into place for all new oil and gas wells from homes and schools. And there was a, a very strict ban on venting and flaring. Uh, this is uh, important to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's one of the best bans in the country. Only Alaska uh, has a similar ban in place. And this also protects wildlife because venting and flaring has been shown to uh, harm birds, uh, sometimes even kill birds, unfortunately. However, I'm going to talk about the expanded definition of high priority habitats that expands uh, the kinds of animals protected, the types of ha their habitats that are protected, and um, the buffers around important locations that have been defined or expanded. So this... Um, story starts with talking about how animals, unlike humans, um, cannot 
just pick up and move when something happens to where they live. And uh, that's true for humans as well, actually. So under these rules, uh, under the old rules, right now I'm showing a map um, that shows what areas were protected for wildlife under the old rules. And this, um, these are the places with the most strict restrictions on surface occupancy. The new rules added over 5.5 million acres of land that is protected under the most strict rules uh, that are currently defined as restricting ground disturbance. So the creation of oil and gas wells, the creation of roads that go to the wells, the, the well pads, and so on. You can see a major change under the new rules is impacts aquatic species, so fish and uh, amphibians. Uh, there is now a buffer around major lakes and streams. There are other areas with additional protections. And in addition to these strict protection, there's also protections of other areas where it, before development can occur, the operator must work with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to ensure that what they're doing is not interfering with the wildlife in that area. For example, uh, areas where wildlife migrate. And in those areas, areas where consultation is required over 12.7 million new acres are protected that were not protected before. So the, again, um, showing the slider map uh, in orange is showing the areas that were protected under the old rules. This includes the areas with the strictest protections and additional areas where consultation must occur. And here I'm showing areas that are protected under the new rules in brown. Again, you can go to our website and you can look at this yourself, moving these sliders back and forth. Now I'm going to talk about some specific examples of places where the protections make a dis difference across the state and for different animals. Let's start by talking about bighorn sheep. Bighorn sheep are Colorado's um, state mammal, one of the most uh, watchable species in Colorado. Uh, love when I'm traveling around the state to see the white spots up on a hillside that indicates that the bighorn sheep are there. One of the hidden places in Colorado, or at least hidden to most of us, is Purgatory Canyon. That's a steep canyon in southeastern Colorado, beautiful Red Rock Canyon. That is uh, the home of the largest bighorn sheep herd in Colorado. Now I've put up a map that shows um, where this is. There's a small insert map here that shows this area in southeastern Colorado. Uh, this is um, adjacent to and includes the Pinion Canyon uh, Army site. And showing here the strictest protections under the old rules. There were uh, significant areas protected uh, for bighorn sheep under the old rules. Now looking in dark brown under the new rules, that areas have been expanded based on new data from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and also showing the stream corridors that have additional protection. So again, under the old rules and under the new rules. The uh, second of three examples I'm going to present talks about big game migration, specifically in the North Park region in North Central Colorado. North Park is an amazing uh, valley that has uh, a lot of wet, important wetlands, 
um, it's important for uh, birds and animals and fish. And it also is the um, one of the ends of the Platte Valley mule deer migration corridor, which has been extensively studied. So these deer move from Colorado to Wyoming and back seasonally. And the new um, rules now protect uh, my big game migration corridors that were not protected in the past. Now this map is showing going back to the consultation triggers. So these are um, areas where the developers must consult with Colorado Parks and Wildlife before they do new oil and gas development. And we can see in orange under the old rules that there was a, were significant protections in the North Park region, which you can see where that is in this insert map. However, um, these studied migration corridors that are also shown on the map are not completely protected. There are gaps in the protections and those gaps could be significant. Under the new rules, uh, th those gaps have been filled in for most of the migration segments and the new rules allow as additional study happens, allow for the um, protect the areas that are protected uh, to be more accurately mapped. As a third example, I wanted to bring in a uh, fish species because of the importance of the expanded protections for rivers and streams. Colorado pike minnow is one of the Colorado river fish that uh, are under threat and have been listed under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, you can see this is a pretty big fish that this uh, gentleman is displaying here. Uh, however, uh, these used to be up to six feet long. And um, the Colorado park minnow is, Colorado pike minnow is listed as endangered. And um, it is one of the uh, fish in the Colorado River corridor. And here we're looking in um, western Colorado. And we can see again under the old rules that there were areas near the river that were protected, but the river corridor itself wasn't. In blue on this, you can see there's a narrow band of protection under the Endangered Species Act itself. And now looking at protections under the new rules, you can see the new rules protect a wider band along the river, which is very important um, to protect against uh, things like erosion uh, and potential spills from oil and gas development. And you can see that many of the tributary creeks are protected as well, which uh, provide habitat for numerous species and are important uh, sources of nutrition for species like the pike minnow. And I think I counted wrong because there is one more very important species I want to talk about, and that's the Gunnison sage grouse. It's one of the 10 most endangered birds in North America, one that Rocky Mountain Wild has been working very hard to protect. It is related to, but not identical to the greater sage grouse that exists uh, throughout Western United States. The Gunnison sage grouse now only exists in Colorado and a small population in Utah. The range used to extend into New Mexico as well. And the largest population of Gunnison sage grouse is in Gunnison County near the town of Gunnison. However, for a species to persist, there need to be multiple populations for genetic diversity. And one of those is in Dry Creek Basin, which is a, a very remote part of Western Colorado. You can see on the map, it's right near the Utah border in Western Colorado. And um, under the old rules, 
there were protections for the breeding areas called leks, uh, where Gunnison sage grouse, like greater sage grouse, do amazing mating dances. Now, these birds are particularly susceptible to oil and gas development, particularly impacted, because they are smart enough to realize that if there's a tall structure near where they want to do their mating dances, that a predator might be roosting on that. Um, they're uh, very popular um, for raptors, for eagles and hawks. And if they feel endangered by that, uh, they will not uh, do their mating dance. They're not quite smart enough to figure it out that they could go somewhere else the same year. It takes uh, generally takes a new generation to figure out that it's possible to mate somewhere else. And so you can see under the new rules that there is a larger buffer around these leks and with some additional protections in this re region. Um, another reason why it's so important that these birds are protected in this population, the old rules uh, were, um, the most recent mapping was in 2013. In 2013, there were two more lek sites, two more mating sites that existed when Colorado Parks and Wildlife shared data were this uh, most recent um, round of rule development. Uh, um, you can see that those uh, mating sites are no longer used. So it's really important that we protect the, this bird whose numbers have been declining in recent years. Here in Colorado, we love our wildlife and we show it through putting protections in place for wildlife that uh, are um, precedent setting, that are um, better than the rules put in place by the federal government and that can serve as an example for the rest of the nation. If you go to the site, um, to the story map, uh, the final uh, thing you will see is an interactive map. This is where you can uh, look yourself at places that are in, of interest to you. Um, one of the uh, capabilities of this map is up in the upper right hand corner. You can click to show this map in its own screen. Uh, by the way, sometimes this map can take a little while to come up, so you may need to be patient. I already brought it up here in its own window. And let me look again at the North Park area. Um, I was showing in the story map, I was showing the places where um, consultation is required. At this point, I'm going to bring up the legend, which you can bring up um, in this window to the right here. Um, by clicking on uh, this icon. Uh, this is showing the uh, strongest protections under the old rules and under the new rules. And you can see a lot of circles here. This is greater sage grouse lek sites. And you can see that there are larger buffers for them as well. Um, and another thing you can do is you can um, do a swipe on this map and see areas that were protected under the old um, under the old rules are in orange uh, and under the significantly more areas protected under the new rules. And can bring this window back to see the legend. You can also turn layers on and off if you wanted to just see um, what was protected under the old rules. You can turn off the new rules. And if you want to compare um, the consultation trigger areas, you can uh, turn those on as well. And you can look for what's 
protected under the new rules compared to what was protected under the old rules. Finally, let's go back to the legend. You can click on an area and you can see um, what species, in this case pronghorn antelope, and what habitat area, winter concentration area, um, is protected. And you can scroll through and see other areas that are protected. Greater Lake Sagegrass Lex site, Pronghorn Antelope Migration Corridor, uh, Greater Sagegrass Priority Habitat Management Area, and then what was protected in the same spot under the old rules, which was um, just Pronghorn Winter Concentration Area, oh, was that, and one more. Uh, greater sage grass production area. Okay, I'm going to wrap up by going back to the website. So once again, you can see the um, link to get to the story map. And again, to thank our sponsors for this presentation. And I'd like to open up now for questions, for people to type questions uh, into the chat. My chat box is disabled. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. I will try to figure out. Okay. Okay, the chat box has now been enabled. I'm sorry for um, not having done that earlier. And if you're more comfortable, you can unmute yourself and say a question as well. Allison, it looks like you have a question about how this affects federal land. So this, um, uh, okay, uh, good question. How does this affect federal land? Um, so oil and gas developments happens in Colorado on federal land, on state land and on private land on federal land or land with federal minerals, the Bureau of Land Management is in charge of leasing those lands, giving particular company permission to develop. And they lease with certain restrictions on how the development can occur in order to actually um, develop the land to, act, to um, put a well on the land the operator has to get a permit from uh, Colorado Parks and Wild, I'm sorry, from the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. And for any new um, well or other development, they have to follow these new rules. The state of Colorado is also working with the Bureau of Land Management to make sure that their rules going forward match these Colorado rules that discussion is just starting and um, but they have commented on uh, proposed um, lease sales that will happen in the future after the pause uh, is no longer in effect. So these rules are stronger in general than the federal rules and they will um, impact, they will be enforced for the um, development going forward. Allison, do you want me to read questions for you? Sure. Great. Um, it says, on the story map, are the protected areas preventing oil and gas development? Actually, drilling was the question. So the on the um, map, it was showing in green areas that are protected. And in general, um, yes, there is no oil and gas development 
or drilling happening in those areas. There are a few uh, exceptions having to do with um, uh, grandfathered rights, things that were um, uh, in place be uh, you know, before the protection went in there. Uh, okay, so in the areas where consultation is required, can CPW recommend no development? And if so, would the COGCC abide by that? Uh, one of the uh, good uh, parts of these new rules is something called an alternative location analysis, which is required to take place. So um, it, a, um, if there's a reason that drilling should um, or development should not happen in a location, then the uh, operator can be re required to come up with a alternative location. Uh, the um, there are exceptions and workarounds, and so it's very important that we keep our eyes out on what's happening. But according to the rules, yes, the Parks and Wildlife can um, prohibit uh, development altogether. Okay, and so we had another question that was what is involved in consultation? And I think um, maybe you just covered that. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Um, the, in um, participating myself in the rulemaking process, sounds like a lot of the major developers um, already reach out to Colorado Parks and Wildlife with their plans. Um, this is what uh, is required going forward. They can create a plan for a single well or a plan for an uh, area. And the um, there are specific employees at Colorado Parks and Wildlife who have expertise both in oil and gas development and in wildlife who we work with the um, developer to try to come up with a plan that will not impact the wildlife in the area. Great. Um, so Tracy is seeing that there's an overlap with Rocky Mountain National Park, for example. And her question is, um, is there a federal consultation process involved in this as well? Um, when the development is happening in a um, place with um, where the Endangered Species Act has defined uh, critical habitat for a threatened or endangered species, then consultation is required with the endangered, with the um, Fish and Wildlife, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, when the development is on um, federal lands or federal minerals, then um, that uh, there is consul there is engagement of the agencies both at the leasing stage and at the permit stage. Uh, and um, by the way, national park areas uh, within the park boundaries, uh, there is no oil and gas drilling, and except in these uh, unusual uh, cases. Great, and it looks just to finish up on the consultation question. Um, we have a question if consultation is a public process. Um, Terry, do you know the answer to that? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know, but um, it's we can get back. It's it, Carl has the question, and we can definitely find the answer to that and get back um, to the I, group. Right. I don't. I don't believe it's a fully a public process, but there. I, I don't know um, what is announced and so on. Okay, uh, then we have a specific question. Um, so using North Park as an example, it seems that there's a significant, there's significant acreage newly protected against surface occupancy. 
the more impactful change may be expansion of acreage requiring consultation. Is this true? And if so, is that also true elsewhere in the state? So uh, yes, there is a significant expansion. Um, that's the uh, over 12 million new acres require consultation uh, compared to uh, what was required before. And that's outside of areas that are otherwise protected. Um, so that is a significant expansion and um, that is uh, something that um, an advantage of the new rules. Great. Um, and then Cindy asks, will the new rules restrict human visits, for example, in purg purg Purgatory Canyons, sorry about that, and the Arapaho National Wildlife Refuge? These rules are specifically uh, related to oil and gas development. They do not um, impact other uses of the land. Um, so restrictions on um, uh, human use or specific kinds of human use would need to be uh, addressed through other processes. Um, and I see Tracy had a follow-up um, referring to the map overlapping uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, so these high priority habitat areas are what the areas on the map are, are called, what Colorado Parks and Wildlife calls them. And they were defined statewide, um, regardless of whether oil and gas development was allowed in an area to start with. And those, that, um, definition of high priority habitat areas, I, um, those areas are, um, those maps are publicly available and they could be used um, when contemplating other uh, protections of areas or development in areas and not just for oil and gas. Okay, to wrap up, um, and I can answer more questions after this if there are any, but I do want to mention that no rulemaking is ever perfect and no rulemaking is ever complete. One of the um, things that was required um, in the uh, legislation that led to this rulemaking was protection of biological resources. And the commission acknowledged that that expends beyond wildlife and therefore they are sometime this year going to put together a working group to discuss what are biological resources and what should be protected. Um, Rocky Mountain Wild has worked to protect uh, native plants, for example, and uh, we will be following that and making sure that uh, the plants have a voice going forward. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today, for taking time out of your lunch hour. Uh, appreciate a chance to share this and um, we will follow up with everyone who registered send them a link to the recording and a link to our story map. Uh, and you are welcome to reach out to us if you have any questions.